Yeah, my, my, my question, and I, I guess I'm struck by the presentation from Adam of Catholic Food Services. Uh, the earlier statement in the, in the morning was that the only institutions that were left, and I forgot which country it was referencing, was the church and the, the cartels. So you seem to be presenting uh, with the youth um, program. Uh, I guess, you know, the question is, then what is the relationship of those two institutions and how respectful uh, is, say, the cartels towards uh, the presence of the church? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. I do know that um, the bishops of all countries, all the countries, have tried to activate all their folks toward, uh, against... Uh, gangs against the drug cartels in the sense of just saying it's destroying the fabric of our society, it's destroying families, it's destroying people. So um, to my knowledge, but I could be wrong on this, I, I, what I'm reaching for is do I, do I, did I hear any stories about um, a priest or a bishop or sisters directly being um, threatened. And I haven't heard that, but that uh, it's a good question and, and it gives me a little homework, quite frankly. Thank you for asking it. I just said to a follow up because I think that the perspective that starts to open up in terms of mobilizing people is really can be the faith community. But I think the faith communities are also needing to move from passion, kind of the passion responses to practical response. <laughs> Could I just make a couple comments that when we talk to children, uh, as part of our intake, one of the questions is whether or not the child, him or herself, has been involved in the past in any kind of gang activity. And th that goes to their eligibility for protection. And the number one answer that we hear more and more from these children when we ask them is, no, soy cristiano. Okay. No, I didn't belong to the gang. I'm Christian. So it's almost developed a kind of a counterpoint. Uh, where you see the gang activity a lot are setting up checkpoints, and a lot of times you see checkpoints set up to, on the way to school, on the way to the market, uh, to prevent access to these critical locations. And more and more we're seeing checkpoints being set up to prevent access to churches. And also you see the gangs themselves beginning to adopt, as the church is essentially the main countervailing point against the gangs, more so than the government itself, uh, you see the gangs starting to adopt anti-Christian and anti-religious symbols and names. For example, what's the name of the lead gang member in your neighborhood? El Diablo. What will the tattoo be? An upside-down crucifix. So as that kind of counterpoint develops, you see the gangs actually developing anti-Christian nomenclatures and identities in order to show that rivalry, which has now gone from anti-government to anti-church. And it also in a lot of the organizing, if there is any of some of the movements of children fleeing away from these countries, uh, it's not as much smugglers. We are hearing about priests being involved. One other point. Um, you know, with the kids, I think uh, the, they, they are getting exposed to church and faith from their countries. And it is one of the resiliencies that helps them, I think, carry on and survive uh, there at St. PJ's. Uh, we do hold services for them weekly. Antonio mentioned he and the archbishop went down to Lackland. Uh, they're asking for the scriptures, they're asking for rosaries, and so we provide all of those things, and it is making a difference for the kids to staying strong. Yes, Hi. Um, I would just like to say that I found everything that you said so informative, but I think it's also really important to emphasize the aspect that, uh, yes, these kids are victims, but we also have to focus on the resiliency that they have and not portray them as, you know, they're traumatized and they're victims because they are, but we also also have to consider that they have the resiliency to come to the United States, they have the resiliency to overcome their trauma, and I think that's going to be really important as these children start to become part of American society, that we don't keep portraying them as trauma as children that are victims. Very good. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and uh, one of the, like, when I, when I talked about what I did, um, I was just kind of sharing in context that if we don't do a better job of having the supports and resources and state-of-the-art kind of care, those children are also going to be at a much higher risk 
of falling into adult problems, such as homelessness and so on. So yeah, they're very resilient, but that's true. If the human body is also resilient to, um, to uh, lots of things, but if you don't get them the medicine to overcome that, then they're more at risk, so. Yes. One, one yes. of the things we've realized in our programs is part of the healing is um, they become, um, they're going out, <laughs> we call it ascending. They go do something specifically about what they've done. And I get everything from the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions to, you know, the at-risk youth program. It's like they need to be leaders. They need to be leaders. You're absolutely right. I think just one quick thing about both comments. It's just both of them. One, I think you're right. It's women are extremely strong. The women that I met at the bases, they will beat me up big time mentally, spiritually, physically, God knows what. I met a woman who gave birth to a baby. 15 days later, she flew her country and went over 2,000 miles just to get to the United States. And she says, actually, Archbishop, after we celebrated Mass, actually baptized her baby, she said that, that was the happiest day of her life. So it's an amazing story, but yeah, I, I agree with both entities. So in regards to the, the credible fear interviews, um, for most non-Mexican children, thankfully, because of the TVPRA, as long as we still have the PR, uh, TVPRA, and that would be um, something to remind your legislators that you think the TVPRA is an important protection for children and that our, our protection should not be minimized um, with the situation we have now. In regards to adults, um, these new these new detention facilities that have sprung up that I was referring to, um, that have, they've really just come up in the last six weeks or so, that presuppose that, and it's mostly women and children that are being housed there, that presupposes that they don't have valid asylum claims. In fact, they were set up saying, well, these are for the people that don't have valid asylum claims. And when they get to the United States, not having valid asylum claims, we'll put them here so we can return them as quickly as possible. Um, we have no idea what these people have been through, except that we can extrapolate that probably, based on everyone who's come before them from this wave, um, they do have valid, as uh, valid asylum claims. And so their credible fear interviews are extremely important for them to have their day in court. Uh, there is thankfully a lawsuit that was filed this week regarding the detention facility in Artesia, New Mexico, um, which is a good thing. Um, because certainly the violations, many of the things that I was discussing up there are things that were documented in the complaint as happening in Artesia, New Mexico. Uh, in Carn City, um, which is where the St. Mary's Clinic has started our work this week, um, we, are, um, under, we understand that those same types of violations are happening there as well. Members of the general public, I would encourage to reach out to legislators, um, reach out to um, the, uh, I mean, it's the administration places people in there who make these decisions. Um, the Director of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, walked around and said, oh, this is a great facility for people who don't have asylum claims. Um, that was something that he said before the people came to the, de to the detention facility. It is shocking to me that a public official would walk out and say, in advance of people arriving, that they have no claim to asylum. Asylum being one of the, I mean, the, the most fundamental obligations that we have under, under international human law, international human rights law, um, to protect victims of crime. So I would say, get on the phone. I, I, I'm going to interject just a minute, too. Because of our interviews with DREAM Act students, uh, the youth themselves can have an incredible impact if they tell their stories and they become empowered to organize themselves and speak up about the injustices that they're facing and their own needs. So I think that's that's an important part of it as well. Uh, okay. <laughs> here and then here. And just kind of jumping in on this, uh, I just met with a, a student who had been in the Border Patrol, and his attitude was that uh, they all have the same story. And I was trying to explain to him, well, that's because it's historically conditioned to be that way, but I think there's very much this perception that, and, and I wonder what, what happens in the interviews when, you, um, when you're trying to prep them, if, if they're kind of getting like a canned version 
of their story and how do you make them how do you make people who are doing the inter who are receiving the interview understand that this is not necessarily just and that's one of the reasons why the Credible Fear interview is so important, that it be handled properly the way that it's supposed to be handled with officers taking the time and asking enough probative questions. It's also important that it not happen within hours of someone arriving to the United States or 48 hours, 72 hours, when they're still completely traumatized, probably from just being released from the Aleta that Jonathan was talking about. Um, they're really in no position to articulate what the heck is going on. Very important that they have know your rights presentations. Um, I've represented asylum seekers from various parts of the world, and sometimes it takes a while interviewing those individuals to be able to get to the root of, of what's going on. Um, for instance, I had, a, I had a client from Afghanistan, and it took a while to really separate of all the many bad things that had happened to her in her life, what was asylum worthy and what was just frankly bad luck. Um, but when you're talking about people from different cultures, it takes a while. The interviewing process is incredibly important and that's why access to lawyers is so tremendously important. Do you want to? Can I just a point of housekeeping. Um, the, uh, the, the, an individual who's apprehended by border patrol and who then faces deportation will go through several interviews. There's usually an interview at the border by a border patrol official. Adults, would then go on to get a credible fear interview by the immigration service. An unaccompanied child should not have to go through that hurdle of a credible fear interview. They are placed directly into removal proceedings where they would see a judge. It is the children from Mexico and Canada who have to face an additional rigorous interview by Border Patrol in order to get across that hurdle and into proceedings. But that's an interview that's occurring literally, I mean, in the, in the actual process of being apprehended. There's no opportunity for an attorney or anyone to intercede in that process. Now, in terms of the credible fears that are happening now with the family units in Carnes and Artesia, they're doing credible fear interviews with the mothers in the presence of the children. And so the children are not being interviewed, only the mothers. Therefore, any kind of SIJ or any of these children who may be abused by the mother, it's not getting screened. And also, if the mother has things to say that she cannot or was not willing to say in front of her children, that, that, that's information that's not getting transmitted. Okay. Is there any effort to draw on the uh, Latino um, immigrant religious leaders and community leaders as uh, a volunteer base? Why don't you take that? Thank I don't think it's uh, yes, especially the Latino community. Catholic Charities, uh, through different partnerships with other entities, non-Catholic non partnerships, we are going through all the communities. Um, right now, we actually started talking a lot more to doctors, different associations of doctors in, within San Antonio who are willing to actually help, not just these kids, but any other kids, um, just for volunteer purposes, for any needs that they may have over there. Uh, we are absolutely trying to engage leadership, uh, religious leaders in the Spanish language churches. We're also trying to engage the arts and culture communities here in San Antonio because that's a big part of our identity. In fact, right now at Raices, which is on uh, North Flores and Poplar, up by uh, M.K. Davis and the Michoacana, we're turning our building into a mural dedicated to the voyage of these children. So it's happening right now. It's being painted this week. I invite everybody to come and check it out. We're having some artists, some well-known artists from the San Antonio, and Antonio community participate in making the mural in order to try to draw out some leadership and attention in that community. And I urge you all to check out the children's art on the table outside. That's brought to us by, where is he? Uh, uh, yes, with the, the art uh, work with the children themselves, trying to demonstrate what their experiences are. Um, as we know, just a few years ago, there were the Zapatistas, and they were in Chiapas. And the revolution there was the fact that the military actually attacked the uh, Mayan people living in the area, they burned down their huts, they broke their sewing machines and their other equipment, and the people left and went up to the hill. And she said, and they would speak out, and they, some students from UT made some excellent films of them, excellent films of people standing in front of tanks 
and saying, don't not come in into your territory. And so now today, you read in the newspaper that a lot of people that are Mayans are coming to try to get into the United States because those are the people probably that were displaced in Chiapas. And so our laws here say no <coughs> refugees if you're from Mexico. As a Mexican, you are not considered a refugee. And so there, if, if whether those 500 children a couple of weeks ago that were being kept as slaves by being sent out to get money and young girls used as prostitutes, this was in Mexico City and the government attacked the people who were holding the children and freed the children. Now, do you have a question for the panel about that? Well, I have a question. If there's so much violence going on in Mexico, why can they be considered refugees? Um. What the, the law states that uh, unaccompanied minors, to stick with that, with that population, should be, first, when the Border Patrol apprehends somebody, there's three questions. One, are you a child? If the answer is yes, then you move on to the next one. Are you an accompanied child? If the child is a child who's unaccompanied, then the Border Patrol officer asks the next question, where are you from? If the child is from any country other than Mexico or Canada, the Border Patrol officer should then immediately place that child into the custody of HHS and in a shelter. If the child is from Canada or Mexico, the Border Patrol officer can have an interview to determine whether that child can go back to Mexico, go back to Canada. The, the presumption is under the law that the child will be victim of abuse or trafficking. Only if the child overcomes that burden in the interview with the officer is the officer allowed to allow the child to return home. This is not, in effect, how the Border Patrol is carrying out this law. They clearly, by the number of children who are presenting themselves from Mexico requesting help, uh, and the small number who are making it through to the facilities, we barely see any Mexican children at the facilities, it's clear that the Border Patrol is not correctly interviewing the children pursuant to the law. There are complaints and there are lawsuits coming on that. Extremely difficult. First and foremost, many of them are misidentified as Spanish speakers out of the box, and so people don't take that extra step to try to get an interpreter for Quiche or Mom or Aguacateca that we're seeing a lot of children coming from. Uh, there are more and more indigenous children as we see the, diff the changes, uh, not just numbers, but there are more Guatemalan children coming, there are more young girls coming, and that's that certainly we're seeing more people from the indigenous communities arriving. They are the, they're the ones who have to face the hardest gauntlet, if, especially if they have to represent themselves, or even if they're with an attorney, they may not be able to effectively communicate. We're blessed in that we have access to telephonic interpreters who do speak these different languages. One comment I would make on the indigenous communities, because there are more and more indigenous people coming, what we see, not just in terms of the kids who are leaving, the kids who are coming, but something we talk about, which is filter rates. And that is the comparison between who is leaving the home country compared to who gets here, who makes it, who doesn't make it. What we see is large numbers of girls in this migration are not making it. They are the, 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 the most subject to being stopped along the route, trafficked, and, and not making it to the destination here. Interestingly enough, as the rise, what we've seen in the data that, from Lackland is that the girls from Guatemala have a much greater tendency to make it to the United States than the girls from Honduras or El Salvador. And what this seems to pair with is the increased number of indigenous communities that are coming from Guatemala compared to El Salvador and Honduras, where it is more urban flight. So you have, uh, literally what you see is that the folks from Guatemala, they share language, they share culture, they share religion and familial bonds. Whereas the folks who are coming from Honduras and El Salvador are leaving the cities alone, and they're getting into groups along the way that they find for safety. But that the Guatemalans, you see it in photographs from the journeys, literally you see groups of young children where the boys surround the girls physically and they travel in that group. So it's, it's, it's their indigenous status that makes them more vulnerable, but it is these shared bonds that actually protect them 
on this journey. Here and then here. I don't know if this is relevant or not. And I've been to a number of these meetings, and I have heard nothing but support for these kids. And I'd be curious to know what the panel thinks of Governor Perry's approach or Senator Cornyn's approach. It seems awfully different to what I hear when I'm at the meetings. And just <laughs> Touch I'll touch that one. Um, <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> it's a good thing about being your own boss. Um, so, um, uh, Raisis made a finding of 63% uh, eligibility, strong cases at Lackland. And uh, in an interview, Governor Cornyn, who's one of the supporters along with uh, Governor Cornyn, Senator Cornyn, who's along with Congressman Cuellar, supporting the humane, the Orwellianly named Humane Act, which would uh, truncate the adjudication times of these cases, force the children to prepare their cases in a week. It would, it would disallow them from being released to family members. Uh, it, it would be a draconian act. And um, he, in a telephone conference, expressed doubt uh, of the numbers that we found uh, uh, at the facility. I fortunately had an opportunity to speak with the senator. He, he was very polite. Um, um, and uh, he essentially, in, in a one-on-one in -on -one conversation, had no arguments to support his findings. Um, and he was very polite and asked for my card for his staff to follow up with us. So, uh, and I just found out we're getting audited by the state of Texas tomorrow. Too. So it's too late. I've already done it. <laughs> But there is definitely a different perspective represented in our, in our family. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the history tends to repeat itself. The thing that's going on in Kearns County, it has happened before at T-Dunn Hill in Taylor, Texas. A lot of activists from San Antonio with Bill uh, Caravan all the way to T-Dunn Hill to liberate the children. But now that the children were at Lapland Air Force Base, they kind of remind me of the children that were kept at Guantanamo Bay in 1995 when I volunteered at the Spanish wing to go over there and assist with all the Cuban refugee camps. And one thing that I did notice is that they required special dietary food. So they were tired of eating uh, military MREs. So that could really mess up the system. Has anybody asked these children? Uh, what is it that they eat so that way they can eat that here in the health of the system? And to learn from lessons from T. Don Cullen, take that into consideration in terms of counting what's going on today. Sure. Um. Good question. There at there at St. PJ's Children's Home, uh, again, we we have been caring for just under 2,000 children. So, in the percentages that with that we've already heard about, and one of the things to keep in mind uh, as a not-for-profit is um, in a 24/7 facility. We also have a contract with the um, Texas Department of Ag Agriculture, which is under the U.S. Department. USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. And so we um, provide uh, all the appropriate nutritional values that we're supposed to, but we also, um, we know that these children also probably get a lot more um, fruits and vegetables uh, than maybe our own kids do. And so we have a, a lot of that available, not only in the traditional times, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but all the snack times as well. And, and we have just gotten, actually, no surprise, the kids are so grateful uh, for the meals that they're being served and thankful. And, and as opposed to some of the more traditional children that we serve sometimes, um, when we do a survey for our kids, uh, just like maybe at the university sometime, what's the number one things that our kids complain about? It's the food. Yet the children, our unaccompanied children, never complain about the food. So um, that, that's how I'd answer that. So I think two comments. Uh, one was Lackland Base. Um, on a Friday afternoon, I got a call telling me that the, the base will be closed that day. And I don't understand why the media did not report until the following Monday. So for three days, no one knew that the kids were not there. You know, I don't know if they were afraid of people going and protest. I don't know if they were afraid of people maybe throwing stones, like, you know, to the kids, as it happened in some other cities, but I don't know. Food-wise, uh, Lackland Base, I went on a Sunday, and uh, that was a special day, I was told, because they have pan dulce and they have coffee. Uh, so it surprised me that that was a special day, you know. 
but everybody I spoke to, they like the food, all the kids, as well in Kansas City, they have rice, beans, chuletas, you know, the whole thing. So for breakfast, people, the kids at Kansas City have like bananas, apples, you know, the chocolate milk. Um, so it appeared to me that actually we're, we're being fed their food. One more, I think, and then we'll have to stop. But <coughs> yeah. I have a feeling that until now we more or less have a, a, had a feedback of a uh, reactive uh, kind of a, a situation mm -hmm. where the children are already here, but not a proactive where we already treat the problem uh, from it come, where it comes from. And I wonder that probably Dr. Roma will organize another seminar where we can discuss those uh, facts, where they where they correct, <coughs> or how the countries in the region here or peer uh, peer governments influence those situations in those countries, and also in the states because of the drug consumption and so on, and maybe put some pressure on the government here and the governments elsewhere. I don't know, but maybe you you did otherwise. Mm. I think that's a very good idea and a good thing to stop on that we could have another conference and invite representatives from some of these countries, scholars from these countries, people who are working there in the field to inform us about what effort is going on there to stop some of the, the concerns here. Uh, <laughs> one, one more, okay, and this is it. This is the last one. Well, you know, first of all, you know, I would like to thank you all this, you know, all the time and the effort that you actually open to the kids. And it's uh, really, you know, it's well appreciated, you know, just by me. Um, I work at UTC as an art instructor, and Andrea and I, we just from, uh, basically formed this uh, collective of artists to do uh, uh, art projects for the kids. So we went to this organization that I cannot name because you already mentioned it. But the deal is, we have been there for a couple of times and really enjoy it. And then my, I think uh, I want to say thank you so much for what you're doing. And I, I think uh, we can actually make a change. We, it's not just based on money. It's based on time. And I think we can make that, you know, significantly, um, you know, change to actually help these kids just with time, no money. So thank you so much, you know, from the bottom of my heart. If you need help, you know, in our price, something like that, please don't hesitate to come back to us, Andre and Juan Mora, Andre and So we're working, just, you're very, we're very fresh in this kind of a movement and this kind of, kind of effort. But if you need our help in doing projects for the kids, please contact us. I mean, I would like to talk to you after this, but, you know, the main thing here is actually thank you so much for, you, for what you do. Yes. And thank you all of you.